Omar Mukhtar was born from a poor household and uh, he learned Islam from an early, uh, from an early age. He was very young when his father died on route to Hajj and he was put in the care of Sheikh uh, Hussein al Ghariani. And uh, uh, Sheikh al Ghariani talks about him and says that this man was always, Omar, Omar Mukhtar, even as a, as a young man, uh, he was always in a state of wudu. He never missed Salat al Duha. He always prayed to Salat al Tahajjud. He slept lived little and he was known to recite and uh, finish reading the Quran at least once a week even up until his shahada. He even understood the diseases and how to deal with the types of diseases that were uh, prevalent within the desert. And he was known to settle disputes. Uh, he, he understood all of that very well and he crucially understood the, the desert terrain very well. There's a, um, you know that, as I said, the film about him is called The Lion of the Desert and that's the nickname that he has, that uh, Asad al-Sahara. Uh, and there's a story about him that, that they were on a trade route and Traditionally, what they would do is that uh, if they expected, they expected lions would come along so that they, they would keep one camel behind, a weak camel, a, a, uh, a camel that wasn't able to do the journey, perhaps. And they would leave that so that the lion would eat that and leave and leave the rest of the, the caravan train. When uh, they asked Umar, uh, Umar al-Mukhtar to take part in this, he refused. He said, no, I will not do that. I will not give away an animal just like that. If the animal, if the lion comes, I'll fight it. And indeed, a lion came and he fought it and he, and he shot and killed it. And when they asked him to, to, uh, to talk about, to praise, to, to boast about what he had done, he said uh, simply, this is nothing to boast about. I didn't even shoot the animal. I, and he quoted the verse, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى And you never shot when you shot. It was Allah who shot. Uh, and that he quoted from the verse in uh, uh, Surah the person who was charged, as I said, to go and uh, deal with Umar al Mukhtar and the Sanusis, uh, Graziani, said about Umar al Mukhtar, he said, No matter how hard I try, this man will never surrender. Every time I make a plan, this man is a champion plan spoiler. He spoils every plan that I get, make. Um, but the pressure mounted. Some spoke about going to Egypt and uh, uh, hiding there and coming back to fight again. But Umar al-Mukhtar said, I will never leave Jabal al-Akhtar area. And he was very firm on this. And his firmness was so strong that it actually inspired others for them uh, to remain also. Uh, and then in one battle in 1930, the, the, the final battle he had, uh, Umar and his Mujahideen uh, were surrounded in an area where they had uh, come. There was only 40 of them, small number of them on horseback. And uh, they... The Italians got word, again, there were spies all around. Um, uh, they, they found his horse. So in this battle, they attacked him. They found his horse um, and his spectacles. Now, just after that, he wasn't captured here, but it was close to it. It was very close. And uh, Graziani said, I have today his spectacles. Tomorrow, I'm going to have his head. During this time, the famous author, uh, Muhammad Asad, who you, you may all know of, had, uh, who wrote the book, uh, um, The Road to Mecca and The Road to Medina, uh, was known as Leopold Weiss, who had become a very strong European Muslim thinker and convert. He came and actually met with Umar al-Mukhtar and showed his great support for him. And he said of him, he said, when I looked into his eyes, I saw the eyes of a man to whom danger was a daily meal. Um, it, Omar Mukhtar told him, uh, Muhammad Asad, that the struggle, the jihad is slowly coming to an end with more aerial bombardments, with the uh, concentration camps, with spies, starvation, barbed wire, massive barbed wire fences going right across the length of uh, Eastern Libya, right to the Mediterranean. So they were trying to, uh, to, to, to block them in. Um, finally, uh, during a scouting trip um, to check on other Mujahideen positions, Omar Mukhtar and 40 of his horsemen uh, in the uh, Jabal al-Akhtar region um, came and were this time fully surrounded uh, at a river that they were at. And uh, they started to fight, started to fight off um, the Italians. Uh, but Omar al-Mukhtar was shot in his arm and his horse fell and, his, uh, and it fell and trapped his other arm. And the Italians, they came around and they captured him. And about his captivity, he said, as a cap, uh, uh, he said, my arrest, my capture is a confirmation of the Qadr of Allah. 
I am now in the hands of the fascist Italians, but Allah does as he wills, and I have never thought of surrendering to you ever. When they caught him, subhanAllah, he had still his rifle and six cartridges left, um, but they were taken. And uh, what remains is that thought of this man with his rifle on his horse, stern, old, brave, pious, standing in the face of the fascists. This is what the fascist leader, Graziani, who was known as the butcher of Libya, said about Omar al-Mukhtar. Omar was endowed with a quick and lively intelligence. He was knowledgeable in religious matters and revealed an energetic and impetuous character, unselfish and uncompromising. Ultimately, he remained very religious and poor. And even though he had been one of the most important Sanusi figures, it didn't change him. And I just want to read to you a little bit about what happened on the trial date, which was on the 15th of September, 1931. Um, if you look at what happens at the trial, uh, and this again is from this is from this is not from a Salabi, this is not from the Libyan Muslim talking about him, this is from the Italian sources speaking about him. They charge him with, I think, over 15 different charges, all to do with rebellion. And he responds by saying one thing. He said, I never submitted to the Italian government. So I wasn't rebelling against how can I rebel against somebody I never submitted to in the first place? Uh, one of the officers, they tried to, to, to uh, an, a military officer, of course, because he's in the military court, tried to defend him. And he affirmed again, uh, every single military action that they said he did, yes, I did it. I fought and I killed, I fought and I killed because it was my job to, my religion taught me to do so, etc. They asked him, did you kill any prisoners? Um, and, and apparently some prisoners were killed, but he said, that's the only one that he said I didn't do. I didn't give the order for any prisoners to be killed. And that was in line with his belief that um, the prisoners should not have been killed. Uh, rather, they it's better to keep them to exchange. Um, they tried to make him out to be a bandit, to be a robber, to discredit him. It didn't matter because of thousands of people now. Some of them forced to, be, forced to come to watch the execution, um, but others were, just wanted to see their hero, their leader, uh, the sheikh of jihad for the last time. Uh, on, at 9 a.m. on the 16th of September, 1931, um, many crowds were there. He walked up to the gallows reciting, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Fighter jet, fighter planes rather, these uh, Italian fighter planes were flying overhead in jubilation, but also to, to let people know that this is now a complete victory. Our planes are flying above and your leader is getting executed below. But Omar Mukhtar's response to all of this, his last words uh, actually send a shiver down your spine and give you a great deal of sense of joy and hope. And he said, Ya ayyatun nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatun mardiya. O oh, you soul that is at rest, return to your Lord, well pleased, pleasing him. And the hangman's noose was put around his neck and he was hanged until he was dead. And so, so died the great lion of the desert, Omar al-Mukhtar, and his legacy lived on, continued to live on, continued 